That's great. Um, cool. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so yeah, as Michael mentioned, we're kind of just going to go through a quick sort of 20 minute overview of Count and um, what the what the platform does, how folks are using it, and then we will have a lot of time to just ask questions and kind of figure out what it looks like in the real world. So um, Taylor, I'm going to kick it over to you. Sure. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Hello. Can you guys all see that? Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So yeah, the plan, I'll give you a quick background to give us a little bit about a um, story about us and Count and how we got here. And then yeah, I'll go through the platform, why we've built it, and then a quick demo. And then obviously most of the time will just be for you guys to yeah pick our brains. And if you guys have questions while I'm talking, please um, interrupt. That'd be great. Uh, so yeah, quick background. This is our quarantine team photo. <laughs> and there's um, five of us there. Uh, the two founders are both named Ollie, so it's easy to remember. Um, one of them is on the line in the same place where I took that photo. Um, <laughs> Where's your blue jacket? <laughs> <laughs> or shirt. The past. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we've got, it's, yeah, the international team. So, uh, yeah, I'm from the U.S., obviously. Brennig here is based out of Wales. And then um, the other three are just English, I guess. Typical. Um, and, yeah, we've been going, the team's been going since 2016. Um, like I mentioned before, I've been around for about a year and a half. And most of the team has been around um, at least that long, but longer, probably. And we just went into beta in March. So, barely new. Uh, we built Count, um, basically we started talking to a lot of companies about very generally how they are using data and the problems that they're facing and kind of focused a little bit more on small companies but talked to larger companies as well. Um, just kind of every aspect of their processes, what was working, what wasn't working. And basically we came back with a few consistent themes of problems. Um, the first one was that at, at some point, it always happened that there's an analyst bottleneck where they couldn't get kind of SQL queries out fast enough to people in the business. Um, and, and that was really slowing things down. Um, also, they tended to have data all over the place and it was hard for them to get that data in one place to kind of bring uh, metrics together from separate sources. Um, and that took a lot of effort um, to try to do that and was often really challenging. And basically setting up a robust data pipeline was taking a lot of time and a lot of money. And everyone had this ideal about what that might look like for this ideal data stack. Um, but getting there was really difficult and took a long time. And especially for smaller companies, it was just not ideal. Um, so we thought about what we could do about that. We looked a little bit into the data science world. This is how we came up with using notebooks. So count is all based in notebooks. We have no dashboards, which has been a little bit controversial of, a, of an opinion, but um, you can, we just use notebooks, um, which I think is really great. And you can also do, um, it's an all-in-one platform, so you can um, store your data and count, transform it, and do all of your reporting in, in one place. You don't have to have several tools, you can do it all in one. Um, so this is kind of yeah, a diagram of how that would work. Um, and that is, a very quick rundown of what the idea is. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I can dive into the demo, but does anyone have any questions off that? No, silence, cool. So um, this is an example of a count notebook. Um, as you can see, we've got kind of text dispersed with images and all this. You can make this, this kind of has markdown formatting. You can do a lot of different things with it. Um, you can see we've got data over here on the left-hand side. So there's a CSV file that I've uploaded of movies data. And then we've got some, these tables are coming in from Airtable. So we have an Airtable connection and they're here. For the demo, I'm just going to focus on the movies data. I've got a quick um, question. Yeah. So um, is this like, is this what the actual editor looks like? Or is, is this looking, are we looking at like a rendered document right now? Oh, this is the actual editing view. So I can create cells and 
edit this however I want to. Oh, amazing. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I think in particular, I'm going to be curious about like how this compares against our markdown and okay. obviously Jupyter notebooks. I'm sure you're going to go in there, but to the extent that you call that out, that'd be helpful for me. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, the main way I would say it means exactly what I was going to be talking about next anyway is actually how you start to query data. So the main way like you can see here is you can just drag stuff in. Um, so I can drag in release date and movie ID and it will automatically do a table for me. I can change this, can add in kind of basic functions uh, to make this let's say count distinct. I need to move my window. Okay. Um, and then you can easily turn that into a visual like this. So we've kind of recreated the one down here. Um, you can also do, this is code modes. So you can type in other things. Um, so you can do like contains title measures. So this code mode allows you to do more of what like basic SQL functions. Um, and then there's a whole list of functions that we can go through, but it is SQL based under the hood. Um, but just has more power than what you can do with drag and drop. And then you can also, everything gets translated into SQL. So you can see the actual SQL query that's being run in the background. Um, and so the main difference then is that you don't have to know SQL to be able to use this. You can still create queries. And yet if you do know SQL, you, you're not sacrificing the power of using SQL to do that. And you can still validate everything that you're building in, in a language that you understand. Um, if that makes sense. And then the only other thing I would say, so each of these cells, you can go into an expanded view and customize the charts. So you can change that to a bar chart. You can change these axes around. You can also change your, um, change the query from here as well. At any point, you can just go into the table view and look at things by table. Um, so you can get kind of a in-depth look at whatever query that you've run there. Um, so this is, um, as we walk through, kind of this is just a list of the oldest movies in the data set. Um, successful franchises, Star Wars. And then one other thing worth calling out is, so this cell here that we've made is just directors who've won Best Picture. Um, Right, so it's filtered for best picture winner is true. Now we can use these cells that we've created on the left hand side to create new cells. Um, so in this cell here, we're going to look at all the movies for just the directors that are in this cell. Um, so we can do that here by basically saying, I want directors to be equal to these directors here that I've just built. Um, so any cell can be referenced by any other cell, which means you can create like kind of infinitely complex queries, but in a step-by-step -step format. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the, the demo. I wanted to give most of the time for you guys to kind of yeah, ask questions. And if you wanted to see, oh, how would I do this analysis or something or this calculation, then I can go ahead and, and do it in real time on the screen and that type of thing. Um, so yeah, if anyone's got, question to shout. So this seems really cool. Um, uh, is this SQL only right now? Or do y'all also have like R and Python capabilities and sort of like, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, right now it's just SQL. I think we're definitely focused on the data analysis realm at the moment. Um, we're thinking about ways to integrate with existing data science pipelines. So how could this integrate with Python models and things like that. Um, but for the time being, it is just SQL. Yeah. And so um, I'm sorry if I missed this. I didn't, so it looks like you're sort of, you've got like sort of drag and drop pseudo SQL here. Is there a way to drop into like raw SQL? Like if I have a complicated query that can't be expressed in your sort of DSL here, like can I just drop in and write a regular SQL query? That's coming very soon. Yeah, like within a few weeks, you'll be able to do that. But for right now, you can just view it. Um, but yeah, soon you'll be able to do that. Cool. Can you talk a little bit more about how data is getting loaded in? Um, so you yeah. obviously uploaded a CSV for this um, example, but 
with other sources? Yeah, good question. Um, so the way the the rest of the platform works is you have this this Ardenda Mifflin workspace, and you've got different projects here like this. So this can be like your sales team project or you know, hey, Q1 analysis project, whatever it is. And then you've have the option of having different data connections. Um, so like I mentioned before, we've got the Airtable one. Um, we've also got these and a few other ones that are being built right now. And so you can just go in and add these connections like this, and then they get refreshed on a daily basis, or you can manually refresh them if you want to. And then um, how they actually interact with one another. So let's say, you know, in this project, I added in this CSV file, um, I'm actually able to specify the schema between the different tables. So if this CSV file uploaded should connect with an Airtable, um, table, lack of a better word, uh, I can define that relationship here so that you can automatically join any of these tables with any of the CSV files you uploaded, if that makes sense. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. I'd love, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about like your sort of where you see this fitting in, right? So, you know, there's companies out there that have Looker, this is probably surely not a drop-in replacement for that. There's other companies that are sort of Excel shops. Like who, who is your target customer? Sort of like where are they in their life cycle? What are the problems that they're facing that this is like the real solve for? Yeah, so we've definitely built this to be for small teams who need to get something from their data very quickly. And they don't have the time and resources to invest in kind of uh, the whole stack of having Looker and DBT and all these other very specialized tools and they just need something that can bring their data together. That they There's transparency inherently built into the tool. Everyone's using the same thing. Um, and that's really where we see it. And then as if the if those companies continue to grow and need more of those specialized features, then they can still integrate with Count and add them in. Um, but it's definitely built for these early stage companies so that they can save the time and money from having to build that stack um, at, at an earlier time. And so, um, sorry, go ahead, Dylan. I was gonna say, um, on those teams, what kind of collaboration um, can people work on the same notebook as their transparency into edits that people are making? Yes, yeah, so it's all, real time, we've decided not to let multiple people edit the same notebook at the same time because everything is so integrated. So like if you built down in cell D, you're building something that was referenced in cell A and then your teammate comes and edits cell A, then your cell D is kind of broken. So we've got a lot of, um, basically it's a little bit of like a Git model in a way. So you can fork these notebooks and create your own copies of them. And then they're visible to the project. So you can have like view only versions. Um, so one way that that works is, let me try to find a good, good example. Um, I just did one on Netflix recently. That's pretty good. So you can have kind of a notebook like this that functions as like a data prep uh, where you do your cleaning and stuff for the data and this would be visible to people but not editable by people so they would understand how you what transformations and things you've done to the data before it got to you so that they could comment and say hey i would like to i don't think we should have this filter on i think we should change it blah 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 and then the output of this file or the output of this here final output gets saved to be referenced in the analysis that i've done as well um, so this is like another kind of a report and again here's the final report which shows you the whole end-to-end -end pipeline of how I got the data in the first place to how I prepped it um, and what I'm doing with it now and that is all viewable and shareable for the whole team and in fact this one is actually public um, so anyone can come and look at it. You mentioned adding a comment can you show us that? That's also coming soon. 
uh, yeah, there's a lot of things coming in the next few weeks um, that just aren't live for tonight's demo. But the way that would work is kind of like in Notion, how you could like you could take this and then basically have a comment on the side, or you can have comments at the top, like that. Cool. How does the uh, version control integrate with this? You mentioned sort of this forking model. Is there actually like a Git backend that could be that could be referenced? Yeah, so I'm actually really excited about this. Um, we've just kind of finalized how this is going to work. So um, you can save versions of this like you wouldn't get, but since it's auto refreshing, it will automatically save versions of this as well. And you can always you can go back at any point in time. So you could like save this as it is right now and then continue working and then say, actually, I don't want to use this one. I want to use the version I had before. And you can go and see kind of a whole list of all the other versions of this notebook. And you can say, this is the one that I want to be live. Or you can be working ahead of the one that's technically live. So if you have a notebook that is spitting out a few tables that other people are using, you can keep that one as like, this is the live one. And then if you're kind of experimenting with different ways of like changing that, you can be working ahead of that and then not make the switch until you've done all your testing and things like that. Um, so that's kind of how it will work. And this, this probably works by branching? Um, so you can still, the way you kind of do branching is there's a duplicate option, which is how you could create like a different branch from a notebook. Mm -hmm. But it's through this kind of, this is like a notebook key, and then you'd have different hashes for different versions of them. If that makes sense. Mm. Okay. It, and the different versions, is that actually like you, like the, in Git you have your commit hash? Would it be like, is it actually the commit hash for the version? Um, or does it have its own versioning on top of that? I'm not sure how exactly we'll hash it, I suppose, but the functionality I think will be, yeah, like that where you can see, you know, there would be another hash after this, which would be the version that I used yesterday or something, if I saved a view of it yesterday, if that makes sense. Okay. Not sure if that's answering the question. So could, could I see, do you have the, the like Git repo? That would be yeah, so I guess like is it is it Git under the hood or is are you implementing your own versioning system here? Yeah, it's not Git. Um, so it is just um, our way of versioning that would allow similar type of functionality because it is this is all kind of real time editing. Um, so it's different than like pushing changes. So things are automatically changing. Um, so just the way that we do that is just yeah by the automatic saving versioning that's there. And then the kind of, you can also say like, I would like to save this version that I'm working with right now. It's like a designated save. And then you basically have a list of versions of this notebook and you can say which one you want to be live essentially. So, so if I go back in the list though, so like I go off and make some changes. I have one live version. I go back to the live version and then I start making other changes from there essentially like creating multiple branches. How does, is it going to handle that? The, this diff more copies of the same notebook or more versions of the same notebook, unless you wanted to actually like, oh, I really want to change this. Then you can actually fork off of this notebook and then create a new notebook and that, that would have its own versioning. So that would be how you would do the branching. What does sense. a fork look like? Does it create like actually a copy of the document? Yes, so this is a new kind of hashed key here with everything mm. else is exactly the same, um, but it's my private copy. Mm. Okay. Is scheduling uh, possible? That is another thing that's, that's coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, very shortly. I mean, scheduling for like, in what sense I should say? Um, uh, like for example, this prepping data, um, notebook, like, mm -hmm. can I schedule it to run every day? Yeah, actually that part is already live. So the data connections do refresh on their own daily and you can manually refresh them. And so whenever the, this will, 
run basically whenever the data gets refreshed or whenever I refresh the page, all the queries run again. Uh, maybe like I missed that part. Is it possible to like run uh, DDL statements here? Like, can we create a table? Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the way that you could do that is like what I've done here in in this one. Um, so this case, I'm just using a CSV file, but for it, it works the same if it's coming from a, a different data source. So it's coming from Airtable or from your your database. And then I've done kind of transformations on it, so I've cleaned up the data a bit. Um, kind of put it back together and then I end up with this is the final table and then I can save this table to be uh, a new data source in the project so this notebook essentially becomes an ETL script that's outputting a table at the end. But you need to manually save it like with the mouse? Yeah well you just save it once and then that script would run every time your your data gets refreshed. So, but this okay. seems like it could create a cascade that if I have a ton of notebooks and creating copies of them, every time my database refreshes, all of a sudden I have like 50 notebooks trying to refresh against my database at once or a hundred, right? Yeah, so the, um, the way that, so we call these views when you save a, a table like this. Mm -hmm. um, you, when you say like this version of the notebook is live, you're saying that it's creating this view. So you would have to very deliberately be creating a new view every time you duplicated this notebook, if that makes sense. So just because I've duplicated this notebook doesn't mean I've duplicated this view. Okay, so but all the views will be refreshing every yes. time the connection refreshes. Yeah, so the, yeah, the connection from the view to the notebook that created it stays there, but you can change which version of the notebook is creating that view, if that makes sense. Yeah. I guess more on this, the scheduling, so you can't have different views be scheduled at different times. It's all based on the connection. Um, not right? yet. I think that's easily something that we could add in. Um, but yeah, for the time being, all of the data refreshes happen at 4 a.m. Um, or you can manually do them. Uh, but yeah, that, that is definitely something we're looking at building out the capability for that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it possible to um, like create HTML output in the cells? Like Jupyter Notebook, can we create our own uh, visualization with Matplotlib mm -hmm. and like other libraries? Um, no. Um, I'm trying to think of what, so the way that you can kind of do that is, so anyone in your project can, can see this as it is. Um, and you can also get a public link, which means like if I send you guys this link, um, you'll all be able to see it, but you won't be able to see the data behind it. Um, I can go ahead and send it in the chat. So that's kind of how you would do like HTML version of a Jupyter notebook is essentially read only version of a Jupyter notebook. Um, so that's kind of how we've replicated that. But creating custom visualizations is not possible. So we are limited to uh, like the like the built in visualizations here, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, like there was no, it was on SQL only actually, yeah. Sorry, um, sorry. I'm I'm not my voice. I've lost my voice. But um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the the roadmap. What where where you would custom visualizations ever be possible, and what else are you all thinking about to add? <clears throat> yeah. Holly, did you you made it sound like you wanted to answer? That? Uh, I was actually coughing, but I'm happy to answer the question. I think because you're right. Hi everyone. Sorry, I'm I'm Ollie. I'm also with I work with Taylor. I am um, being a bit scattered this morning because I've got bath time. It's evening here in the UK, so I've been doing bath time. So I couldn't rely upon being able to be here the whole time. But I'm now I'm now free. People are asleep. Um, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, so as Taylor's been explaining, the, the the big this is a BI platform. This is about allowing people to do BI, and we've the big innovation here is to we hope is allowing more collaboration, more transparency by using notebooks rather than dashboards to allow a long form approach, giving data analysis context. 
And the, the, the big enabler of having a notebook, as I'm sure you know from the, what you do in Python, et cetera, is that you can use that to do more than just reports. So we, we, we want to enable the notebook to be a way to build a data pipeline, to create views, create data models, uh, which, are, which are version controlled uh, very shortly and allow you to reveal to your users clean data models, which, are, which have a defined schema, which they can join using drag and drop. But more importantly, you can also, as a more technical users, you can still write pure SQL or our notebook SQL, as I think the state has mentioned. So you, you have a proper collaboration environment, basically, in a notebook form. That's the principle of Count. It's to, to allow you to, to, to work as a collective team. Uh, it does mean that, as you may be, I mean, you're, you're, if you're looking at this from a sort of a, a proper sort of, um, sort of a data engineering perspective, it does mean that there are limitations. Like you, a lot of people we're working with on our beta are still using DBT to like define highly, highly version controlled uh, data models, um, with, and they're using Count as more of a prototyping methodology. Um, because you can use Count as a visualization platform or as a, as a data data warehouse and fully full solution. So that's what that's what we're finding. So to answer your question around that way, Daniel. Um, there's a lot of work to do in the notebook still. Version control, as Taylor's mentioned, is, is really important, and you've, you've highlighted that in this, this session, which is really helpful. Allowing you to write SQL in here directly, because currently we've got uh, drag and drop and our own notebook SQL, which is quite fun. Actually, if you want to look at our documentation, it's uh, pretty concise compared to a full-blown SQL, but as, about as, um, well, has the full sort of query domain of SQL, um, just doesn't force you to write the full template of select statements out. Um, we are uh, working on, um, yeah, primarily the notebook itself has a lot more functionality to add. And the more we enable the notebook to do, the more you can do in managing your pipeline is a simple answer. So version control, um, SQL directly into the notebook itself. Um, we want to add, a, there's loads of collaboration we can do here. So the, 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 one of the huge excitements about this is that you can, behind the scenes of this notebook is a, is a highly connected graph, right? Every cell, has, we, we own, and know the primary foreign key relationships of every single table in your data database and in every cell from the notebook, which means we can give you huge amounts of power about how to build complicated queries, which we're not revealing to the user quite yet. Um, and I think when we do that, you can have a really powerful way to join data and give your users far more complex data models to interact with, which are far more empowering without it being a, a query nightmare effectively. Uh, because you can they can have that full data model fully normalized available to them to use and and have that full question domain available to them was that a roundabout way of answering your question uh, yes the very, other thing which we're aware of is so. that, yeah it is a roundabout i agreed uh, <laughs> um i guess the the other the other thing which we are currently limited by is that we we run and maintain the data warehouse for you um so the idea, Dylan, Dylan, you, uh, Dylan G mentioned the, the issue of a cascade of notebooks as you sort of update your data source into count and then you have all your views or your notebook training views would then run. We, that is not a problem you need to worry about, right? We will own, we own the cost of that, of that running, that cascade. There's no spike in your usage if you're using like a, a maintained service. We will just smash through it basically. So you have, your, you have a live update of all your views, your data models, and then your notebooks as, an, as you need it to. So all that kind of complexity of managing queries as and when, because it's a fully connected graph, um, which is version controlled, it doesn't really matter to you. You get the full experience of um, all that kind of version control that has to be taken away from you. And the primary way we think that's valuable is because if you're a smaller team with less resource, you don't have to spend 100K a year on a full data pipeline, right? With your ETL, your um, transformation layer, your data warehousing, and then your visualization platform model on top of that, which is one of the most expensive parts. You have that fully built into count if you're getting going. So our hope is, that count is a, a great option if it's your first data platform. If you're a, guy, if you're a team setting up, uh, you've got like one analyst in your team, then this should be a great way to get your, get your full data set going and empower the team as quickly as possible. So how do you, I, how do you imagine a team going from this to the next stage? So if this is a small team starting out, you're wanting to have like all this data centralized into your tool and then, okay, well, now we've hired two more data engineers, we actually want to bring the data and set up our own data warehouse. How do you imagine the, the, like, that process is going to go from migrating actually maybe out of your tool into something that would be more robust or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I hope relatively easily, like actually behind the scenes of each notebook is a SQL script in standard SQL. It's quite easy to export that. We don't allow you to do it quite yet, it's not like you press a button to export, but it's, it's ultimately SQL, right? It's not as difficult to transpose it across. Um, 
our hope is that we will eventually be able to run count on any data warehouse that you choose. Like we believe that the the big innovation here is primarily about moving dashboards away and putting notebooks in place for business users rather than just for technical users because of the benefits of collaboration and transparency. So the bigger win here will be that we want to evolve to a point, a bit like Looker did you know, from 2015 onwards, it was to go, you have to use our Redshift data warehouse initially, and then they now let you run work on, a, on your own data warehouse. I think that's the natural evolution we're gonna go on ourselves when we have the capacity to deal with that kind of additional bandwidth. Um, that's the hope, that's the answer I've got commercially. Uh, I think in the short term, um, it will be about transposing your data out and then we will help you move across. It's a, it will help you do that transition basically. So, so right now, or is all of the computation happening on, like all of the computation and transformation happening on the count side? It's not like sending queries to the data warehouse or the database, it's actually pulling the data in and then doing everything on your servers. Is that, is that the right understanding? Yeah, exactly. Because because we're abstracting a lot from you, right? We're to, be, to some people on this tech call probably hate the idea of this, but we're abstracting away a lot of complexity, uh, and that we can't therefore charge you compute. And so we've gone. Look, let, let's take that. We'll take the whole compute challenge away from you. Give you the give you a presentable form. So the aim of the notebook is it's you know presentation ready. We say it's raw data to final presentation in one document. You can use it for you know transformation, but also it can be a board paper. There's no reason it shouldn't be that. Uh, and it's designed that you can collaborate directly with business users rather than you're working in Python and they're working in whatever BI tool you have. It's like the same place. And there's this huge wins in that we're seeing from that. Um, yeah. And so, that's so are there like, sort of take, are, are there take, data take limitations? Like if I have a big data set that's in my Redshift or, you know, BigQuery database that's like, I don't know, a billion lines long or something, like is your, is your platform going to be able to handle that or is it going to sort of, is, is it going to face these limitations? It seems like it works great with like CSV files that you can load up in here or yeah. Airtable things, but maybe not with like a big data, a big data problem or even like a, a larger data problem. Yeah, the bottleneck will be on import. The bottleneck will be on import. So it depends on the frequency which that data set has to be maintained. That's where the right. bottleneck will be, like how, how well we were able to ex import your data size on a daily basis or weekly, that's that's where the limitation comes. That's why we we have to sort of allow you more flexibility on the frequency which tables import, because you don't okay. for big tables. It's more about it needs to happen at a <laughs> at a pace that actually is doable given the bandwidth of our connection. Right. Okay. That makes a lot Michael, of sense. if you've got one, we'd love to try it. Let's give it a go. I mean, like, listen, there's plenty, there's plenty of free giant data sets out there. If you want to, if you want to load test your, your data warehouse. Yeah, well, well we, we have tested it. Yeah, we, we have tested it. Um, and we, we've got, we have, to be honest, we haven't tested it to like tens of terabytes, but we've tested it with some terabyte, terabyte files. And it, what we're actually quite amazed by, I mean, obviously it varies quite a lot by companies. We've, we've geared up the tool to work at terabyte level happily, but we've just been surprised at how small data sets people have, actually. Yeah, it might be the case that no one needs it, right, at the size that you're working with. I'm just sort of trying to get I my think, head around, like, where the yeah, pieces yeah, yeah, fit yeah. together. Yeah, so it, as you say, we, you know, the, the, yeah, we want to be your first data platform for people who are resource constrained and can't put in $100,000 $100, a year into, into a data pipeline off the bat. Like, that is a, the biggest pain point I think we see from startups particularly is, you know, like, they know what they want to be. They know what it means to do data well. They just can't afford to do it. And they have this, like, they step, they sort of eke it out over many years to get a Series B and finally buy it all. But that it's just the pain of getting there. The ramp up time is is death, basically. Um, so that's where we've been surfing. And I think um, a lot of the users on beta now, I mean, we have the most of them are working with like up to like 50 gigs data warehouses, right? It's not, it's not, it's um, not huge. Which we were, sadly, I was like disappointed by that because we worked quite hard to make sure it worked at a much bigger scale than we were. I should have done my <laughs> research better. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about what y'all are thinking about for pricing? Um, like what, what, what are y'all looking at in terms of, I think, like actual numbers and then in terms of like how is that model going to be structured? Taylor can do that, I think. Uh, she's got Taylor? the tab open. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they expected that question to happen, isn't it? <laughs> um yeah so i think in general we are like i mentioned because it's built for small teams growing um you know we're looking to give you quite a bit of storage for each user that comes on and then if you need like bulk out on storage that's extra but um it's meant to scale with you and it's not gonna all of a sudden explode up in pricing um, when you throw in a bunch, bunch more data into it uh, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you can kind of toggle with the different 
sizing and, and things like that. But um, yeah, that's basically what it is. So, so I should say the pricing model is designed to give flexibility. So the aim is that you price per user, uh, but you also can add a storage in, as you can see here. And it's priced that, we, one of the big principles of the pricing model we're going for is that we don't want to charge different amounts of money for different users and limit their functionality. Like the idea that this viewer, this kind of viewer reader, I find it's abhorrent because it sort of suggests data, data elitism. So we go, instead of saying, you know, let's, you can have, some people can only read stuff because they're not clever enough to do anything more. I think that's really, really nasty. So we have a, a, a flat pricing, all the, every user is by principle to do whatever, they, whatever you want them to do as an admin. But we then change the pricing per user as, it, as you grow up in team size. So we recognize that the hundredth person is going to be using the tool less than you. Um, and the idea is that we, we, we have a, a, a combined user seat price and data because we know that some teams want to use count as a visualization tool primarily who may already have a data warehouse in place. Um, and therefore you just pay per user and then you, the, 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 the storage per user you get for free. So you mean you can get your data models in there comfortably and they can do their kind of reporting visualization layer on top of whatever stack you've got. But if you are having a data warehouse and you, and you really can't afford the, the cost of maintain, maintaining it and the maintenance of it, then you can just use count. And, and as your data grows, you can dump it into a data warehouse and you can and grow the size as well. That's why there's two bits to it in the calculator there. Um, how do you think about, so like, I think with, with the model that y'all have, it's, it seems like you're, you're sort of, you, there's, there's a couple of different pieces that are being combined here. So when I think about one of the, one of the problems that I think about a lot is in BI, I have this desire to like make dashboards that get updated every day and sort of anyone in the company can come and like look at it at any one point in time. On the other hand, when I tend to be using notebooks or at the very least like an R markdown document, in general, what I'm doing is I'm making a report that's like frozen in time. Right? It's like, I'm doing this, this research this month, I'm gonna do this investigation and I'm gonna write up my results. And like, I actually, I really don't want that to be updated, right? Like I don't want new data to come in because then like all of the text that I've added might not make any sense. Like there's all kinds of, there's reasons why I sort of want that to be frozen in time. I might want to update it at some point in the future. And like, but like, again, keep those documents separate and maybe actually like look and compare what's changed between the two of them. Um, so, so that's sort of like two very different paradigms of working. How do y'all think about those different things and how they interact and how they relate to your tool? I think you can, the idea is that you'd be able to do them both in here um, and how they get presented to the user. Um, you're right, there probably should be some kind of designation of like, this is a report, this, this data gets refreshed daily versus this is a one-time project. Um, but I think that is where the, the actual project could help. So if this was a one-off bit of analysis, you could create a project that had its own data sources and really isolate the environment that you're working in at that point in time. And you can always go back to it and see the work that you've done then. Um, versus if you had, you know, this is the sales team project. We have, this is the report salesperson of the year, or this is the report for you know monthly sales data that gets refreshed regularly. Um, but yeah, the idea is that the notebook would allow you to do both of those things equally well. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thinking more about this, um, like what's underlying the notebooks and the version control as well as the migration. And I'm a little curious why um, you aren't actually saving it into a, like a Git repository and like saving the SQL, because if it was in something like that, then I could actually link it out to other services using the like generated SQL that's stored in a GitHub repo. So you have essentially count on one side, creating these notebooks and creating SQL that does migrations. And then on the other side, I can hook into that and read those files at particular commit statements. Um, and it sort of bridge it, could bridge that gap. I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts nice. on that? Yeah, no, sorry, I, I think we should clarify. Um, we're not saying we're not gonna do what you just described. We're just saying it's not. The primary, the, the primary use case we wanna serve right now is enough version control that you can feel confident and you can have lockdown versions for, for version control of data models but also to enable end users. So end users are not gonna use Git, like fundamentally end game, like not gonna happen. And this tool is bridging between, like this is, 
the, the experiment here, I guess, which I, you know you could buy, you've got to buy into, is that this tool is designed to be used for by a much broader range of users than you'd otherwise expect. Where like you have a you know you have a, a very a SQL client ID over here for some people, and everyone else is using dashboards. Like aim is to try and bridge and merge the two. So um, Dylan, I think you're absolutely right. Like I can see the use case you're describing; it's very powerful. But and it's not saying we won't do that, or that Git is not the answer in the, in the in the medium term. It's just that we're trying to solve the functionality from both ends from both what does end users want, which means they want a bit more of like a, a client, like a front end focused version control methodology, which is still watertight and you can still be confident it's right. Uh, and also gives you like the kind of undo stack and also allow like proper version control as well. And then we'll branch away from that in, in the medium term, I think. Um, sim similarly with like providing a, a client facing API, right? One of the powers of this would be that you can have a cell which you can re reference in an API and to bring it into your notebook in, in Python, for example, in the medium term, like there's loads of stuff we can do with that. Which we will do eventually. But obviously, there's a, there's a client, there's an, there's an API right now, which we're not reading to you. It's changing a lot, um, but there's lots of stuff we're going to do with that too. Okay. So, sorry, that, that, does that make sense? I just, I just want to make sure. I, I don't want to rule you out. I think your idea is really good, actually. I'm like, I've written it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. You don't seem convinced, but it's okay. We've got more. So we can come back to it after, <laughs> after the meeting. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, was there anything else or if you guys wanted to see, happy to try to do things in the tool, if there were things you were wondering about? Can we play with it? Yeah. Well, actually, um, I, you can ask me to do something and I can. <laughs> uh, you can, if you, um, message Taylor and I will give you an account. Yeah. Awesome. I signed up on the site. Oh, oh nice. right, cool. Well, then that's 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 it. will be on. Get careful with that. You're in the bottom of our waiting list. You can be careful. We'll just be mothers and in a <laughs> locally optimistic. <laughs> we'll get you. It sounds good. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And are you are you are in the context of like use cases? Are I mean, obviously, this is very use case agnostic. Uh, are there particular verticals or uses that you see folks adopting the solution for? Um, do you mean in terms of like which types of companies like, or like different types of companies or different types of teams within those companies? We've seen a pretty broad range, right? Ollie has come through, I think. Um, a lot of people hate dashboards. I think that's what I've, I've come to realize. Uh, Taylor wrote an amazing article actually in, in TDS, uh, over the Easter weekend, which I like, went absolutely mad because basically the message was like dashboards are dead, um, which was quite, uh, Clickbaity, I get, but it, 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 people, a lot of people wrote, got back to us and were like, yeah, I really hate dashboards. Um, both sides of the argument, right? From the data team and also from the end user. Like it's just, it's, it, they are not a great way to collaborate. They are not a great way to see transparency and, and to drive decision-making. Um, so that, that the notebook idea in a BI context, I think is what people have it's brought, brought in a broad range. I think in terms of people who are using the tool, like are most hungry for the tool. I think it's like B2C companies where there's a, they have by nature more data because they're just, mm -hmm. just a larger market they're serving. And so they get into data problems quicker, like the idea of like need to self-serve faster. Um, not exclusively, but that's where I think it just naturally is a more volume to deal with. And they've got a slightly broader team of like skill sizes. So you've got more, a broader range of data sources. You've got a broader range of teams. A B2B, just a much narrower operation generally. Got it. Any other? I like, the I like the design, by the way. Oh, thanks. Seems, seems super well thought out. Yeah, visually, it looks great. I, I think it, it it's not as embarrassing as like putting a Python notebook notebook in front of someone, like <laughs> which is always always terrible. <laughs> oh, that's really exactly. good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk about access control a little bit? So you have users in it. How do you control access to projects and notebooks and and that sort of user access control? Yeah, good question. Um, so for the time being, it's actually very simple um, because everyone is an admin. So um, everyone can see everything. But obviously, we know that's um, just a, you know, needs to be changed. And that's one thing that we are building out right now. 
Um, but basically how that would work is um, it would kind of be done at a project level. So within a project, you, if you're an admin, probably would be the case where you're deciding like, here are the data sources that we have available. You've kind of run a few notebooks or you've kind of piped in the clean data that you want to expose to the users. You could say, I want to give this sales team access to these um, tables. And then within the sales team, you would have different members of that sales team. And then you could designate at that point if the, the person could edit the, the notebooks in that project or just view them, essentially. Um, and that's how you would manage who gets access to the, the data, whether they can edit it versus just viewing notebooks of other things, essentially. <laughs> okay, thanks. Anything else? That's all I had. This was super interesting. Thanks for sharing with us, y'all. Yeah, thanks for the feedback, guys. It's really great to yeah hear what you guys think. Yeah, and, it's yeah. very helpful. Yes. We've got to keep us with Dylan G after this. That's all I think I all I've realized. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I've got I ideas. Think, <laughs> I think interestingly, like where this group is not your target audience, right? Because you're talking to a lot of people who are like sophisticated data practitioners who are yeah. like, we're used to working in different environments where we have DPT set up and we have like lots of these other things. And I think that y'all's target audience is probably someone who's like, you know, a younger data analyst of one, maybe it's like actually the CEO, you know, who's like doing this in, in their spare time. Um, and so I think you know, it's just a very different audience. And so like the, the sort of things that I'm looking for, which is like a really powerful R notebook is like not not at all what y'all want to build or would it be a good idea for you to build given the customers that you're trying to sell to. And so I think, yeah. um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting. This is inspiring me in like a number of different ways. Um, and so I think like, it's important to keep in mind that like the audience that you're talking to here is maybe like on a oh, different yeah. level than the audience who you were totally. pitching to normally. I think that's absolutely right, Mike. That's a really good distinction, Michael. Thank you. I think, as I said, we're, you guys are already, I imagine most of you are already a very long way down your data journey. Um, I think what, we, what we've seen and what we've noticed, and even in Notebook Optimistic have noticed, is that there are occasionally the question of, I'm just getting going, what's a good data stack to build from scratch? And at that point, you get like 50 messages saying to do the following things, which are usually out of the price range of anyone who's sensibly going, getting started. And I think that I hope is, that gap is obviously filled with this, is the hope. Like, yeah. that, that's where I think... Um, so if you're, you feel sorry for that one man, that one analyst who's stuck in a team of 50 and has to sell them all and has to be giving them clean data, wonderfully made all the time in a really robust way, that this solution is the hope they can get going with that within days rather than taking months to justify the expense of whatever, you know, ETL to need to buy and then the data warehouse. And it just takes months and months to get going. We've seen so many companies just, as I'm sure maybe you guys have gone through, just having to sort of work so hard with the business to justify every expense and taking years to build a properly robust data pipeline with the solutions that are available. And really there's just needs to be like a one solid tool which can serve those needs well and get you going and get you flying with data and really empower the, that one analyst usually just to really help the business get going. And I think the hope is at that point, then we can help you transition to a bigger tools and we can still be your visualization platform eventually, but there's a need at the start. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a good, that was a good comment, Michael, because I, I definitely have that, like a lot of the working in notebooks and, and Looker and having database knowledge and coming in with that. And so, I, and, and I see how like this can be a really good entry level use case, particularly because of the reason of notebooks is so nice to be able to tell the story with the visualizations all in context. I mean, that's why notebooks are so popular um, yeah. in the Python world. And I just, I'm, I'm just trying to think about like, okay, how, how would I use this tool with, you know, like I, I immediately, you know, my, my inclinations immediately go to just full blown notebooks, but I understand that the, the need for the gap. And so I'm trying to think about like, how would I, how would I use both of those or bridge that gap for my use cases and for this entry level. And I think that also is the problem you're going to have if you have, if you're really starting out with just like one or two people and getting going and then branching into the like, then, then branching and adding in those other tools is that that transition could be really hard because like any BI tool, if you go all into Tableau, all into Looker, 
um, all into, you know, five tran, like they're going to, it, it locks you into that, that use case. And so knowing when that, how that transition would happen or how those tools would play well together with, with count is kind of where my, my head is at. Yeah, I think that, that that actually is a really interesting point, right? Which is like, if I'm the decision maker for one of these small companies, I mean, a lot of them probably aren't even thinking about this, so it probably doesn't matter for y'all, like in terms of strategy. But like, if I were one of those people or I was advising one of those people, that's a good question that I would be asking is like, okay, if count, if we actually don't know if count's gonna last, like is, is gonna scale, what is the transition off plan? Um, and I think that that's an interesting thing to think about is like, what would that eventually look like um, of, you know, if we need to add in, you know, we're eventually going to hire a data scientist and we're eventually going to need to add in non SQL notebooks. Like, how is that going to integrate with count? And like, what is that going to look like? Are we going to, at that point, going to have to tear count all the way down and like build this whole thing anyway? Or is there actually like a transition plan that makes sense or an integration plan that makes sense? I think that that's an interesting thing for you all to think about. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Well, all right, this is so we'll, cool. We'll, we'll learn to pitch this better at the start so you know exactly what you're talking about. So we can go, <laughs> do not worry if this is a... <laughs> no, this is interesting. I think, I mean, I, I'm really excited about notebooks. I like hate Python notebooks the way that they work right now, but I also think that there's nothing better, you know? So it's like, I, I'm really excited about people who are experimenting in this space and like, you know, helping people learn about what works well and what works and what doesn't. And so I, like, I'm really excited about innovation in this space it's happening in a number of different places. And so like, mm -hmm. uh, this was a really interesting for me as I'm thinking about like, what do the future of notebooks look like? Um, and so I think like, this is a, a really interesting angle on it, um, which I think is great. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Michael. Uh, notebooks are awesome, but there's like some problems. That's why version control comes to my head because notebooks and version control, so like, bad. They, sh they should <laughs> work so and bad. it's just so bad. <laughs> uh, scheduling is the other big one, right? Like scheduling notebooks to run and making that not be some weird hobbled together thing. Um, and then like compute and access is another right. thing. Yeah. We didn't really touch on that because you were handling your own compute, but essentially like how you would, would handle your notebook running remotely and that sort of stuff. Like all of those are really interesting. For sure. Excellent. All right, I gotta run, but thanks y'all, this was great. Yeah, um, thank you. Send me yeah. a message if you guys want access. Cool. cool. Thank you. Bye, guys. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Bye. All right.